Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a junior doctor in the Seven Deanery. In the next two videos, we will revise the most common obstetric emergencies. In this video, part one, we will cover preeclampsia and eclampsia, HELP syndrome and postpartum hemorrhage. Let's begin. Preeclampsia describes the combination of clinical features, pregnancy-induced hypertension and either proteinuria or signs of organ dysfunction. Some symptoms a patient may experience include headache, visual problems, vomiting, epigastric or ruck pain, sudden swelling of the face, hands and or feet. The difference between pregnancy-induced hypertension, also known as gestational hypertension, and preeclampsia is that in gestational hypertension there is no edema or proteinuria, unlike in preeclampsia. However, in contrast to pre-existing hypertension, the elevated blood pressure began in the second half of the pregnancy, that is, after 20 weeks. If left untreated, patients may start having seizures and this tetrad of features is called eclampsia. The pathophysiology of preeclampsia and eclampsia is unknown, but it's thought to be related to insufficient perfusion of the placenta, causing release of vasoconstrictors from the fetus that results in widespread vasoconstriction and hypertension in the mother. This continues until the placenta is removed, so the only definitive management is delivery of the baby and the placenta. Some maternal risk factors for developing preeclampsia include first pregnancy, multiple pregnancy, obesity, maternal age over 40, diabetes mellitus, and a family history or previous history of preeclampsia. Preeclampsia can be prevented by starting patients who have risk factors on a daily dose of aspirin from 12 weeks gestation until the birth of the baby. Hypertension is managed by prescribing labetalol, nifedipine or hydralazine. Labetalol should not be given to women with asthma. IV magnesium sulfate is used both to treat seizures and to prevent them in women with preeclampsia who are in labour due to deliver within 24 hours or postpartum and also in women with severe hypertension. Magnesium sulfate can cause respiratory depression, so the respirate and oxygen sats should be monitored during treatment. If respiratory depression occurs, the treatment is calcium gluconate. Fluid overload should be avoided in women with severe preeclampsia or eclampsia, so urine output should be monitored and fluid balance charts should be filled in for inpatients. Women with preeclampsia should be monitored to prevent any complications. Blood pressure, levels of protein in the urine and blood tests for liver enzymes and platelet count should be regularly checked. Overall fetal development should also be closely monitored. Some maternal complications of preeclampsia include pulmonary edema, seizures, HELP syndrome and hemorrhage. Some fetal complications include IUGR, prematurity and perinatal death. Next, let's talk about HELP syndrome. HELP stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets. About one fifth of patients with severe preeclampsia will go on to develop HELP syndrome. Patients present with headache, lethargy, ruck pain, nausea and vomiting. On examination, Patients may have hepatomegaly, ruck tenderness, edema, and bruising or purpura. Hypertension and proteinuria would also be present. As with preeclampsia and eclampsia, the only treatment is delivery of the placenta and the baby. Therefore, corticosteroids may need to be administered if the mother is less than 34 weeks pregnant. Next, let's talk about postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage is the loss of more than 500 milliliters of blood from the genital tract following childbirth. It can be classed as primary or secondary. Primary is when the blood loss is within 24 hours of childbirth and secondary is when the blood loss is between 24 hours to 12 weeks after childbirth. 
It can also be classified as minor or major, where minor is between 500 and 1,000 milliliters of blood loss and major is more than 1,000 milliliters of blood loss. Postpartum hemorrhage can occur for many different reasons, which can be remembered with the four T's, tone, tissue, thrombin, and trauma. When we say tone, we're talking about uterine atony, and that is the failure of contraction of the blood vessels that supply the placenta following its delivery. T for tissue reminds us of retained placental tissue or infection of the endometrial tissue. T for thrombin reminds us of coagulation disorders, and the T for trauma stands for trauma of the genital tract. Some risk factors for primary PPH include previous PPH, emergency C-section, placenta previa or accreta, and prolonged labor. Placenta accreta is where the placenta attaches to the myometrium. Do you know the difference between placenta previa and vasa previa? Placenta previa is where the placenta is low-lying at the neck of the womb, but the umbilical cord is protected and out of the way, whereas in vasa previa, the umbilical cord lies at the neck of the womb within the membranes, and therefore, when the membranes rupture, for example in stage 1 of labour, there is a high risk of a catastrophic haemorrhage. Women with massive PPH should be managed using the A to E approach, as with any emergency. Lie them flat and keep them warm. High flow oxygen should be given. The major hemorrhage protocol should be activated, therefore involve your seniors and the obstetricians really early on. Ensure the bladder is empty by catheterization and commence bimanual compression of the uterus to stimulate contraction of the placental blood vessels. Any visible trauma to the genital tract should also be repaired. As patients will need a blood transfusion very likely, Two wide bore cannulae should be inserted, one in each arm, and baseline blood such as cross match should be taken. IV fluids should be given rapidly to maintain blood pressure. IV oxytocin and or IV ergometrin should be given to correct uterine atony. IV tranexamic acid could also be given to stop bleeding. IM carboprost and PR misoprostol are other medical measures that can be tried. If medical methods fail to work, then surgical options like intrauterine balloon tamponade or even hysterectomy can be considered by the obstetrician. OBS must be taken regularly and fluid balance must be carefully monitored. These will help to identify early signs of sepsis, example in the case of endometritis, hypovolemic shock, AKI and other complications of PPH. Thanks for watching.